If Kirk Cousins sits out the preseason, will that help or hurt his chances to hit the ground running come week one? You are Locked On Falcons, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back, everyone, to another illustrious episode of the Locked On Falcons podcast, your daily Atlanta Falcons podcast, part of Locked On Sports Atlanta, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your purchase. Your first purchase. Terms apply. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm your very humble host, Aaron Freeman, aka Mr. Drew, aka Serious Black, aka the Jolly Green Giant, aka the Iron that sharpens the iron, aka Mr. AKA, and I've been covering the Falcons for far too long, formerly at falcfans.com, RIP, still going strong on this illustrious podcast. And I thank each and every one of you that's still going strong as an everydayer of this podcast that makes it your first listen, your first watch each and every day. And become an everydayer, all you got to do is subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. So today's episode will be a mailbag. We'll be answering some of the questions submitted by the various Locked On Falcons insiders. And if you want to become a Locked On Falcons insiders and get priority on these mailbags, then we'll probably have a couple in the coming weeks. Uh, you know, hit the link in the description below at joinsubtext.com. It's 14 day free trial. Then it's $4.99 a month after that point. You also get access to my film breakdowns. And we'll have a uh, Brandon Dorless one to wrap up this week. So go ahead and, and check out that link. But, you know, we'll answer a couple of listener questions you know, including why I'm not as high on Darnell Moody as maybe other people are, you know, what did Zach Harrison do at the end of last year to, that led to his productive stretch down the, uh, you know, his productive run down the stretch last year. But the bulk of today's conversation is going to center on Kirk Cousins and his tendency to start slow or fast. And that, you know, getting us into that conversation will be a question from Jordan R., one of our Locked on Falcons insiders. Um, he asks, you know, a question concerning a Kirk trade. Is it possible for another team to pick up any of our cap on him or is that guaranteed money a lock? So we touched upon on our mailbag two weeks ago about the possibility of trading Kirk in 2025. But to answer your question, Jordan, yes, I think it is possible that another team, the Falcons, if the Falcons were to trade Kirk at some point, um, they could negotiate with the acquiring team to adjust maybe the cap burdens for one or both teams. But usually the way that works, like we saw this past year with the Stefan Diggs trade, usually the trading team in that case, Buffalo has to take on more cap space than the acquiring team in, the, in this case, Houston, rather than vice versa, which is what you're seemingly asking, which is could the acquiring team, if we traded Kirk, take on more cap space. Usually that's not how it works. Um, now, you know, it is possible for the Falcons to trade Kirk. And frankly, if they were to try to move on from Kirk before 2026, trading him would be probably the least burdensome way when it comes to a salary cap situation uh, for the Falcons. But as we mentioned two weeks ago, Kirk has a no trade clause, which means that he's going to have to agree to a trade. And it makes it extremely unlikely that the Falcons are going to be able to get a trade uh, for him. Um, but it is worth bringing up the sort of hypothetical scenario where the Falcons could trade Kirk before 2026 when they could potentially cut him uh, and move on from him. Because I was listening to an episode of the Locked On NFL Scouting podcast with the Draft Dudes featuring Joe Marino and Kyle Krabs, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, uh, last week where they were breaking down you know, the, the different situations that each one of these rookie quarterbacks was going into. And they were talking about Michael Penix and uh, the Falcon situation when they were generally very favorable of the Falcon situation that Penix is potentially inheriting. Um, but, you know, they mentioned in that episode, the sort of the possibility of the Falcons because of them selecting Penix as high as they did moving off of Kirk sooner versus later. And they mentioned the sort of Carson Wentz, Sam Bradford situation in Philadelphia back in 2016, where Bradford was the starter, they drafted Wentz, and then they wound up trading Bradford to Minnesota that summer. Uh, because Wentz played so well in the preseason, Minnesota, Teddy Bridgewater, that was the summer where Teddy had that nasty knee injury. It was going to miss the season. Uh, and the, and the uh, Vikings were able to trade a first round pick to the Eagles 
for Sam Bradford. They had some familiarity with, he had that some familiar with that coaching staff. Uh, and they figured that that was the thing that was going to keep their playoff hopes alive. And it's also notable that summer was also the summer that Taylor Heineke was in Minnesota. And theoretically, I guess there's an alternate from what I understand talking to Vikings people, um, that there was an alternate reality that Taylor Heineke got hurt that summer. He like, I think kicked in the door or something and he cut himself and missed most of that season due, due to, you know, that injury. Um, but there was a, there was an alternate reality where they probably don't make that Sam Bradford trade if Heineke stays healthy because they were very high on Heineke in the lead up to that injury. And so the Heineke hive could have gotten started basically four years earlier in Minnesota, as opposed to waiting to that 2020 playoff game in Washington. But um, you know, talking about the possibility of a similar situation happening here with Penix being the Carson Wentz, Kirk being the Sam Bradford, and some other team being the Minnesota Vikings in this situation, it's possible. It's extremely unlikely, um, you know, but it's possible, right? Because we're not expecting Kirk to play really much at all in the preseason, and so that's going to open the door for Penix potentially to ball out this summer, so we'll see. Uh, and again, we're just purely hypothetical not saying that this is likely but we'll just have some fun and talk about hypotheticals right could like is there a path where like say houston if cj stroud gets hurt this summer and nobody wants that or san francisco if brock purdy gets hurt again nobody wants that but you know those teams have potentially super bowl aspirations right and i don't know if davis mills and houston and josh dobbs and san francisco are going to really fulfill those you know, aspirations if if you lose your starter for the entire season and you have, you know, Bobby Slowick from his days in Washington and Shanahan, Shanahan himself, you know, Gerard Johnson is the Texans quarterbacks coach. He was assistant quarterbacks coach in Minnesota a couple of years ago. Um, so th those teams, Houston and San Francisco, have familiarity with Kirk. Presumably they run, you know, Shanahan style offense so he could pick up that offense relatively quickly. So if anybody was going to basically pull a Vikings and trade for Sam Bradford, and, and, and trade for Kirk Cousins this summer. Those would be the two teams. They also have the cap space to absorb, or at least 49ers will when they get Eric Armstead off the books on, on June 2nd. Um, they, those teams do also have the cap space to absorb Kirk's contract and rent him for basically a year to keep their Super Bowl hopes alive. So again, hypothetically, not saying it's going to happen, extremely unlikely, but it's a fun thought experiment. That's all we're, we're, we're treating it as, you know, don't get mad at me. It's just a fun thought experiment. Um, but you know, when we have a serious conversation and, you know, since I'm known as serious black, that's all we ever really have on this podcast is serious conversations. Uh, but one does wonder if, if Kirk is limited in the preseason, you know, how does this impact his chances to hit the ground running uh, come week one? And it's going to be a big question for Raheem Morris this summer is, you know, will he deploy his starters in the, in the preseason? Right. Um, you know, he has that McVay influence. And Sean McVay and many of his disciples are notorious because they don't play their starters in the preseason, although McVay did play a couple of guys this past summer, uh, although I think most of those guys were like rookies like Puka Naku and Steve Avila. Uh, but, you know, he did play a couple of guys this summer. Uh, and so, you know, will Raheem sort of follow in that sort of McVay influence and not play his starters? And if he doesn't play Kirk this summer, will that sort of contribute to him having his typical slow start uh, in September. And we'll break down what, you know, sort of the, the stats and data tells us as we continue today's Locked on Falcons. But first, guys, I want to tell you about our proud sponsor, Yahoo Finance, who's giving me the tools to help me grow my savings into so much more because most of my life I've lived paycheck to paycheck. And thankfully, Locked on has been very good to me these past few years, and I can start saving more money to think about my long-term financial future because I don't want to go back to living paycheck to paycheck. So I want to grow that sort of nest egg, uh, you know, in the future. And for more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor, whether you're a seasoned investor or you're like me, just looking for those first steps and that extra guidance to take those first steps. You know, Yahoo Finance is going to give you the tools and data that you need all in one place. They are number one finance destination and they stay on top of the often, you know, difficult to understand financial news cycle. And they'll give you the breaking news, the analysis, the editorials, the independent research, customizable charts, and so much more. So if you're looking for comprehensive financial news and analysis, visit the brand behind every great investor. That's yahoofinance.com. 
the number one financial destination, yahoofinance.com. That's yahoofinance.com. So continuing today's Locked On Falcons, want to plug the Locked On Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel here on YouTube, as well as the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, giving you all that can't-miss analysis that you come to expect with the Locked On Podcast Network, you know, free and available on YouTube, as well as the uh, free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Uh, So the question we ask, does the lack of preseason snaps contribute to Kirk's tendency to start slow in September. And we've mentioned a couple of times now on the podcast over the last month or so that Kirk's teams tend to start slow in September versus how they particularly perform in October and November, right? Kirk as a starter has a career win percentage in the month of September of 34% and a career win percentage as a starter in the month of October of 64%. And, you know, I had a commenter when we brought this up, I think last week on the pod, like, you know, QB wins are not a quarterback set, which I agree with you, but we all know that, you know, quarterbacks get all the blame when the team loses, they get all the credit when the team wins. But if you just want to go beyond the wins and look at Kirk's, you know, stats specifically, you can look at his passing efficiency and he does tend to be more efficient in October than he is in September. You look at his career adjusted net yards per attempt or Anya, our preferred passing efficiency metric in September, it's 6.64 in October at 7.07. And for comparison sakes, Jared Goff's career Anya is 6.67 and Tom Brady's is 7.06. So, you know, Kirk is Jared Goff in, in September and he's Tom Brady in October, basically. And then if you even base it off of PFF passing grades, Right, his average September grade across his career is 68.4, which would correspond to Kenny Pickett's 2023 season grade as a passer. His October grade uh, is 75.2, which would correspond to Baker Mayfield's 2023 season grade. Uh, if you're only just looking at Kirk's six years in Minnesota, his average PFF passing grade in September is 73.6, which corresponds to Tyrod Taylor's passing grade last year. In October, it's 81.6, which corresponds to Brock Purdy. And so I use those comparisons. You know, in September, he's Kenny Pickett or Tyrod Taylor, non playoff quarterbacks last year, versus, you know, in October, he plays more like Baker Mayfield and Brock Purdy, which were playoff caliber quarterbacks. So uh, it also backs up not just, you know, the, the wins and whatnot. So when we talk about McVay disciples not playing their starters, uh, you know, that includes Kevin O'Connell, the head coach of the Minnesota Vikings. Kirk did not play a single snap in the preseason in 2022 or 2023 when Kevin O'Connell took over. Um, and if you go back and look at Kirk's worst September's, at least in Minnesota, in terms of Anya, right, that's with 2020 and 2022, right? 2020, there was no preseason that summer due to COVID. And 2022 was also the first year of Kevin O'Connell's tenure there. So Kirk was learning a, not a brand new offense because, you know, he runs a McVay Shanahan style offense, just like Clint Kubiak, the offensive coordinator in 2021 and Gary Kubiak, the offensive coordinator in 2020 and, you know, Kevin Stefanski, the offensive coordinator in 2019 and uh, John D. Filippo in 2018, all that stuff. So they all run derivatives of the Shanahan McVay style offense, but having those first year play callers did seem to, you know, lead to slower starts. And of course, the Falcons, you know, Kirk is running a derivative McVay Shanahan offense here in Atlanta under Zach Robinson, but it's his first year running that offense. And so you wonder a little bit if he's going to get to a slow start. And the tendency is if he doesn't play in the preseason and is in year one of a new offense, he starts slow. However, that isn't definitive because if you look at Kirk's best Septembers, at least based off of Anya in Minnesota, that was 2021 and 2023. 2021 was year one of Clint Kubiak's offense calling the plays in 2023 of course was year two of kevin o'connell um so it's not definitive right it is not as simple as say oh year one a new offensive coordinator he doesn't play in the preseason boom he stinks right but there is a trend there right um that that is the trend and you know we'll we'll see how it goes all right and you know it'll be easy and lazy for me to basically say oh if you play kirk in the preseason he's guaranteed to start fast if you don't play him in the preseason he's guaranteed to start slow it's not that simple you know, on-field success, especially in the regular season, isn't probably dictated at all by how many snaps you play in a preseason. And, you know, for a quarterback, it's, you know, who's your supporting guests? Who's calling plays? You know, what teams are you facing that are going to be more indicative of that, you know? And so that leads to the same 
situation we have here in Atlanta. If Kirk and this Falcons team is going to start fast in September, that's going to hinge on the run game, the blocking, the weapons, the play calling, the defense, all those things. And those are variables that are more determined by coaching Raheem Moore, Zach Robinson, Jimmy Lake, than it is, you know, how many snaps you play in a preseason. You know, the, the real value of preseason is, is really about figuring out who's going to be the 53 guys that are going to make your squad, right? Preseason is really an evaluation tool. Um, and, you know, that's part of the reason why last summer I remember, you know, getting a lot of pushback when we saw the Falcons starters play in that Bengals game against, you know, Zach Taylor and the backups. Because, again, Zach Taylor's a McVay disciple, doesn't play the starters in the preseason. And I basically said I was, quote, unquote, unimpressed by the starters during that one series. And, you know, I got a lot of feedback being like, you know, this offense is fantastic and, and all that stuff. And, you know, basically the, without going too deeply into that, you know, uh, you know, those 15 plays that we saw from Desmond Ritter and the starters, you know, didn't really tell me anything new when it comes to evaluating the offense. But, you know, when it comes to Kirk, you know, he's what started 150 games in his NFL career. So nothing he really does in the preseason is going to be that consequential to any of what those actual starts against, you know, real defenses and, and real games. Um, but I, I do think you can make the argument that there is some value. Again, how much value you put in it or I put in it or Raheem puts it in and Kirk puts in it or whoever else puts in it, you know, it depends, you know, your mileage may vary. But I do think you can at least make some argument. There is some value of getting Kirk's feet wet before we get to the quote unquote live bullets, right? Like the preseason is like rubber bullets, right? It's live fire, but it's rubber bullets because it's all vanilla stuff. And, you know, theoretically, you, you you shouldn't die. You can get hurt by a rubber bullet, but like it, they're not lethal, right? Theoretically, like real ammunition is. And that's kind of the difference between the preseason and the regular season is it's live fire with real bullets and, you know, the preseason is live fire with rubber bullets. But, you know, that's a, that's a decision that Raheem has to make. You know, that's his, his job to do. He's, you know, he's making millions of dollars to make those decisions. And like, you know, you, you guys know me, I'll, I'll find something to complain about when it comes to the Atlanta Falcons, you know, that's why they call me Mr. Drew negative Nancy to my friends. But, you know, I don't think sitting here in May that one of those things I'm going to complain about is seeing more of Michael Penix in the preseason. Right. Um, you know, and given that he's likely if all things go, go according to plan and we don't get one of those hypothetical trading Kirk to Houston because CJ Stroud, you know, tore his ACL in the first day of training camp. Um, you know, like, it's very likely that Michael Penn is going to redshirt his year. And so getting him as many reps now as an evaluation tool for the future to sort of see what, you know, what's going to be the quarterback situation in 2025 and beyond, you know, is valuable. It's, it's similar to me to what we saw in 2016, uh, where you saw Chris Chester and, and Wes Schweitzer have a quote unquote competition for that right guard spot. And I remember saying like, I don't think it's a real competition, but I think because the Falcons understand that Wes Schweitzer is going to redshirt this upcoming 2016 season. And he did, I, I think he was maybe active for like one game that year um, that they wanted to see him go up against, you know, the better competition, not, not premium competition because again, it's preseason, uh, but better competition as an evaluation tool, because they, they also kind of knew that Chris Chester was very unlikely to return in 2017. So Wes Schweitzer would have the opportunity to show, Hey, he should be the front runner to replace Chris Chester in 2017. And, and that was the case. So that's kind of how I, I sort of see the Kirk Penix dynamic. It's like, okay, let's get Penix these reps because theoretically we're not going to see him again until next summer, um, you know, in 2025. And then we won't see him again until uh, 2026. So those reps are, are going to matter for him much more than they matter for Kirk Cousins. But obviously want to plant that seed now because it's going to be a topic of conversation when we get to August, right? And we'll we'll see how the Falcons sort of handle that. But we'll wrap up today's episode talking more about Zach Harrison and what he did at the end of last season that led to his improvement and, and sort of our expectations for him now going into year two and why I am not 100%, you know, hyping, uh, you know, Darnell Mooney and jumping on the Darnell Mooney bandwagon as a high-end number two wide receiver. And we'll break that down to wrap up today's Locked on Falcons mailbag episode. So, of course, with the schedule dropping last week, we know there's a lot of intrigue. And, of course, our friends at Game Time are going to help you, you know, take the guesswork out of buying those tickets uh, with their killer last-minute deals. They're all in prices and their views from your seat. And I love the views from your seat because, you know, now that we're sort of looking ahead to September and, and whatnot, you can sort of start the picture. W where am I going to sit, you know? 
uh, if you're not a season ticket holder and you, you don't know. And you can go to game time and you can get that preview from your seat. And you can you can now start the picture. Okay, what's it going to look like when Zach Harrison is, is dropping Russell Wilson for a sack? And where where's the best angle for me to get that view? And you can do that by heading over to game time in the app. Just download the game time app. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL. That's L O C K E D O N N F L for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So tomorrow's episode, you know, if your cues aren't aid on today's episode, you know, don't worry, we'll possibly get to some of them tomorrow and potentially next week, like the Falcons, I'll be taking a little break. And so that leads to us to more mailbag episodes typically uh, next week. Uh, but, you know, I think tomorrow we'll also talk more about sort of what are quote unquote realistic expectations for this trio of rookie pass rushers at the Falcons draft by looking at some of the data that, you know, looking at what the average pass rusher you know, rookie pass rusher that's taken around where those guys are taken winds up doing. So that will be a topic to dis- explore tomorrow on the podcast as your first listen. So make sure you subscribe uh, so that you can get that as your first listen on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. But we'll wrap up answering Juno K's question. Have you gone through any of the all 22 on Zach Harrison since season's end? If not, please do and let us know your thoughts, where he improved the most, why he still needs work. I know his first step is still a work in progress, et cetera. Thanks, brother man. So I did go back and watch the last three games that Zach Harrison played against Carolina, Indianapolis, and Chicago, arguably his best three games. You know, the PFF grades and data support that, like his run stop rate according to PFF in those three games was the best among NFL edge rushers during that three game stretch, his pass rush productivity, which is pro football focuses per snap pass rush metric uh, was also top five among all NFL edge rushers during that three game span. So why was Zach Harrison so much more effective during that three game stretch? And I think a lot of it was just, just natural progression, getting more comfortable with more reps throughout the course of the season that it just seemed better at knowing how to use his hands to disengage from blocks and beat blockers, you know, knowing how to maximize his power, which he has an abundance of, and just simply doing a better job recognizing what he was sort of seeing in the backfield so that he can go and make those impact plays against the run. So as you mentioned, that first step, right, the biggest thing that Zach needs to work on in theory is his snap timing, where he was consistently late off the ball last year. And even during that three game stretch when he was productive was consistently late off the ball. And if he can figure that out, which relatively speaking, should be the easy part of playing the position, right? Like, you know, it's, it's difficult to beat an NFL offensive tackle. Like you and I probably can't do it. Uh, and so that takes unique skill, but you and I probably could figure out how to come off the ball uh, quickly. Uh, and so if, if Zach can, you know, figure that part out, he should be good. So I'm expecting continued go for growth for him. And, you know, I think it's a positive to see that he's uh, bulked up per our guy, Joe Patrick of 92.90 game. We put out a tweet on Tuesday and for the, um, video watchers on YouTube, I'll put it up on the screen. And for the audio listeners, I'll read it out. And Joe Patrick tweeted Falcons D lineman, Zach Harrison looks noticeably bigger to me standing next to him. He said he has indeed put on weight, which he added was always the plan heading into his second season. He said he's played all over the line so far in OTAs. No surprise as versatility up front is a priority. And so you absolutely love to see it. We talked extensively about Zach's potential to be that sort of bully, you know, shoving nerds into their lockers, you know, going around slapping ice cream cones out of kids' hands. And we're, we're, we love to see that from Zach Harrison and bulking up, I think, is part of that to lean into his power game, which to me is the A plus trait that he possesses that ability uh, to just knock dudes back. Um, and especially, you know, bulking up, given that he's probably going to play a lot more interior D line this year than as the edge rusher that he was primarily last year. And we talked about this two weeks ago on the on the mailbag. Then it was sort of, you know, what's the possibility of Zach playing edge? And it's possible, but it does seem like the plan is to have him play more uh, in interior on the D line and adding mass. I think is going to be beneficial to him. And he did get a, a number of reps playing on the interior in those final three games. And I thought showed flashes of what you want to see playing more of that four tech or five tech. That is a sort of classic three, four defensive end than that true sort of six or seven tech edge rusher. Now our last question comes from Ernie a, I keep hearing that our main guys on offense are going to be London Pitts and Bijan. I get that. My issue is that it seems like no one 
seems to say that Mooney is going to be a big impact. So why did they pay him as much as they did? So the Falcons paid Darna Mooney like a market rate number two wide receiver. If you look at the $11 million a year contracts signed by Jacoby Myers in Las Vegas last year, Alan Lazard with the Jets last year, if you adjust for the cap increase, $11 million in 2023 cap would be worth about $12.5 million in 2024 cap. And the Falcons paid Darna Mooney $13 million. So that's right in line with that. It's about the same as what Gabe Davis got from the Jaguars to sort of be their number two. Uh, obviously, he might have to take a little bit more of the heavy lifting because they thought they were getting Calvin Ridley back to be their number one. So I can't really speak to why others are not hyping up Mooney as much. I can only tell you why I am not. Uh, and I talked about this briefly with the Lockdown Falcons insiders back in March when I broke down all five of, yeah, wait, five, four, five of the Falcons free agent additions um, on offense during that first week of, of free agency. Yeah, five. Um, and I think Mooney brings speed to the table, but he's not a particularly productive vertical threat. We talked about this uh, last week on the pod and, you know, some pointed out, well, that's due to poor quarterback play that he's had in Chicago. And while I'm not going to sit here and say quarterback play doesn't matter because it certainly does, but I don't think it's as important a factor in who's productive as a vertical passer. That's why, you know, if the quarterback play w was the equalizer, then why did DJ Moore ca catch 60% of his deep 20 plus yard targets, deep balls from Justin Fields last year and, and Mooney only caught 25%. And you can look at the Falcons history. Like you go back to 2010 to 2014, right? Over that span of time, Julio caught 44% of his deep passes. Roddy caught 40% of his deep passes, but Harry Douglas only caught 22%. And it's like, is, is if the quarterback play was the, the great equalizer, then you would see those numbers be a lot closer. But clearly there's some difference in skill set, you know, between Julio, Roddy, and Douglas and the same with DJ Moore and Darnell Mooney. And another thing that Alan Sterk mentioned on yesterday's episode is, you know, Mooney making contested catches and the numbers don't really support Alan with that, that take. He's only caught about 29% of his contested catches according to PFF uh, over his career. That would, you know, be in like the 15th percentile most years in the NFL among wide receivers. And, you know, that's part of the reason why I think his vertical catch rate is so low because oftentimes you have to win those contested catch situations down the field. The other issue that despite having speed, Mooney's not as dynamic after the catch as you probably would assume, right? That like when you get him on screens and whatnot, like if he has a runway, if he has a lane, if the blocking is there, like, yeah, he can, you know, get big gains, but he's not going to be a guy that's going to make a ton of like dynamic cuts in the open field and make a, a ton of guys miss in the open field like that. Like he's not Cordero Patterson or someone who has that like, sort of natural kick returning ability, like a Rondell Moore, like a Ray Ray McLeod, those guys that are really good after the catch. Right. And so for me personally, in general, I want my number two wide receiver to check one of two boxes, ideally both boxes, but one of two boxes. I want you to be either explosive or you need to be efficient, right? And by explosive, I mean sort of a, a big play waiting to happen, either that as a vertical threat or being that sort of dynamic playmaker after the catch. And I don't think Mooney checks that box. And then efficiency to me is like, you know, moving the chains, right? It's third and seven. I need you to go and get opens so that we can keep this offense humming. And that's not really something that Mooney has been exceptional at either. And so that's part of the reason why I typically lump him in. He To me, he's more of a number three wide receiver in the same tier of guys like Muhammad Sanu and Russell Cage and the Lama Aziz Kias that I mentioned on yesterday's episode. And at least with those three guys, you wouldn't call any of those guys explosive in the sense of like a big play waiting to happen. Like they did make big plays uh, during their time here. But really what they excelled at was, you know, that sort of efficiency when it came to third downs and moving the chains. Those guys did good work in that regard. Um, and so like, I don't know if Mooney really does that. And so again, your mileage may vary your pro you know, there's every reason for people to be higher on Darnell Mooney than I am. I'm just explaining to you why, like, I'm not sitting here, you know, pushing the Darnell Mooney hype train, uh, like others may do. And, you know, he could wind up being much better here in Atlanta because of the improved quarterback play, because Zach Robinson's offense is better than, you know, the offenses that he played in, in Chicago. It's not to sit here and say like, he can't be better than what he was in Chicago. Um, but it's just hard for me to get super excited about Darnell Mooney because ultimately to me, he's like a quality number three wide receiver. And that's all well and good if London Pitts and Bijan, as you point out, Ernie, are, you know, out here, you know, killing it each and every week. But, you know, similar to the conversation we had with Mac Hollins last year, like if that doesn't happen, you need your number two wide receiver to step up more. And while I think Mooney is better than Mac Hollins, I don't think he's like a tier 
better than Mac Collins. Like they're on the same tier. Maybe Mac Collins at the bottom of that sort of high end number three tier and Mooney's at the top of that tier, but like it's still a similar tier as those guys. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, that's going to do it for us here on today's episode. Uh, if you're looking for more Braylon Trice impact, we'll probably get to that breakdown on Sunday night here on YouTube, Monday morning on your preferred audio platform, but we'll set the table potentially tomorrow with some quote unquote, realistic expectations for him in the other uh, rookie pass rushers, as well as here, Roman Tomashoff of Locked on Huskies on Braylon Trice. If you want to get priority on future mailbags, by all means, join the Locked on Falcons insiders. Link in the description below, 14-day free trial, then $4.99 a month. After that, Discord, link in the description below, is also a place to submit your questions. Email address at LockedOnFalcons at mail.com. And make sure you subscribe uh, on YouTube or your preferred podcast platform uh, so that you don't miss the Falcons historian shootout that will begin next month. If you miss the details on what that is, the Falcons historian player shootout, I should stress, um, the details of that were on yesterday's pod with our guest, Alan Sturk. So uh, that is going to do it for us here, guys. Appreciate you. It's all part of Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.